Great. Good evening. I'm now calling the Tuesday, August 15th, 2023 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to order. The time is 7.05 p.m. Please note we are conducting a hybrid meeting, uh, which allows staff and members of the public to attend this meeting via virtual teleconference. The hybrid meeting will be video recorded and posted on the district's website. Because we're video conferencing, we will follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when commissioners, staff, presenters, and the public will provide comments. If you've called into the meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing a comment for the benefit of the recording. Please practice considerate video conferencing etiquette by muting your line when you are not speaking and limiting distractive behavior on camera. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Commissioners, I will be conducting all roll calls this evening in the same order. Please remember the order so that you are prepared to provide your comments or vote. President Spreen? Here. Vice President Sherlock? Here. Commissioner Besigi? Here. Commissioner McDonald? Here. Commissioner Tonka? Commissioner Tyson? Here. Commissioner Warren? And we have five commissioners present, which is a quorum. For the benefit of the recording, I will also conduct a presenter's consultants and staff roll call. Santa Clara County Fire Department Assistant Fire Chief Glass. Good evening, present. Thank you. Uh, strategic Planning Consultant Scott is here. here. Mm -hmm. Friar and Loretta Engineering Consultant Tarantino. Present. Thank you. Uh, Community Education and Risk Reduction Manager Gluhan is in the back. I will. <laughs> Emergency Services Manager Bibi. Present. Okay. Programs Planning and Grants Manager Woods. Present. Thank you. Technical Analyst Project Manager Cronin. Here. Operations Project Manager Russell. Here. Oh, hiding. General Analyst Georgie. Here. Thank you. Field Manager Harmon. Here. Is there? Thank you. Project Specialist BB. Thank you. Uh, finance Manager Morreale. I see he's on. I thought he was here earlier. Yeah, I'm, he's, I, I, he's present. Oh, there he is. Thank you. I General Manager that. Logan. Present. Okay. And Deputy County Council uh, Forbath. Present. Thank you. Uh, presenters, consultants, and staff are accounted for. Great. Thank you, District Clerk. We will now move on to item two. Commission President remarks. Uh, just a, three quick things. Um, first, we send our goodwill wishes to our missing commissioners who are out ill. We hope they're well soon. Um, second, we have a you may have noticed in the uh, roll call a couple of new names who are attending their first meeting here with us. I just want to say, on behalf of the commission, we are happy to have you here and are glad and proud having you as part of the staff and. Uh, um, hope this, this is as an enlightening meeting as much as we enjoy being here. We're, we're glad you're here with us. And third, and while I don't want to cast a sort of a darker pall on the proceedings, I think it would be, uh, I don't think we can have a meeting of a fire district without acknowledging really the tragedy that we're all watching happening out in the world in Hawaii, not only to send our, our wishes for what's going on there and to anything that can be done to help, but I know it's easy to get lost in the minutia of what we're doing here, the memos and the contracts and the detail points. This is the most you know, severe and tragic reminder of why actually, actually why we're here. Um, and I wouldn't be able to say that, to say that that's what I think of when we're doing any single project we're talking about, that's why we're here is to do the most preventative care we can do, bring the most safety we can to neighborhoods that we all live in that are full of, fuel and our potential risks. And I just wanna thank everyone for being here. And that's why we're all in the same boat here, trying to keep this, this place safe. So thank you everyone. I just thought it had to be, had to be mentioned and acknowledged for, for why we're here. Okay, we will now move on to item three, public comment. Persons wishing to address the commission on any subject, not on the agenda may do so now. Please note, however, the commission is not able to undertake extended discussion or action tonight on items not on the agenda. Items may be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on the next available agenda. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker, unless the number of speakers requires the commission president to impose shorter time limits. Let's see, do we have any public comments for items not on the agenda? Yes, we have a comment from Alan Epstein. Great. Alan, you have the floor. Yes, can you hear me? 
Yes. Great, thanks very much. I just wanted to mention that uh, at the last uh, uh, commission meeting, I had raised the question about being unable to see the CWPP draft report. And um, one of the fire safe people attending the meeting, I think it was uh, Ms. Uh, Brenner Cannon said that she would uh, reach out to me and, and make it available. I've made a couple of attempts to get access to the uh, draft. I've called the Fire Safe Council and also, also spoke with uh, uh, Irene when they were doing the work on the uh, Mora Ravensbury era. And I've been unable to get a copy of the draft CWPP. So if there's anything that the commission can do to assist me in getting a draft, I would appreciate it. There's a meeting coming up on August 30th for the public to be able to comment on it. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. I appreciate the comments for multiple reasons and more. We will try to help make that happen because it's something that people should have access to. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to item four, agenda amendments and changes. Are there any comments from staff on this item? Uh, sure. Thank you, uh, Board yes. President Spreen. Um, I would like to recommend continuing agenda item 7A district archive presentation to the September 19th meeting so that the Foothill College archivist can join us in the presentation. And then emergency services manager, Bibi, do you have anything to add as a comment to that? No, just that there was a scheduling conflict with the presenter. So um, we'd like to be able to give you a very comprehensive report next time. Thank you. Makes perfect sense. Let's see, we don't, um, let's see any commissioners, I, I guess we'll, we'll include that on a potential motion to to uh, change the agenda, uh, to remove that item. Uh, would any commissioners like to make any other changes to the order of agenda? Seeing none, um, I will now entertain a motion to continue item seven, which is receiving the district archive presentation to the September 19th, 2023 commission meeting. Will the commissioner making the motion and the commissioner seconding the motion, please state their names for the benefit of the recording. I've got- Tyson moves uh, continuance. I second. Great, we have a second. To Thank you. The item's open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission on this? I don't expect there to be. Any public comment on this item? I don't expect there to be. Thank you. If there's, we will now vote. Mr. Kirk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spreen. Yes. Vice President Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner Basici. Yes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Um, Commissioner Tyson. Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Great. Thank you. We'll, we'll look forward to that in September. Moving on to item five, the consent calendar. Any comments from staff on items A through E? Great, seeing none. Any questions from the commission on any of the consent items? Seeing none, uh, I would entertain a motion. Again, will commissioner making the motion and one seconding, please state your names. Got, I see. I move we approve. I second. Oh, and we have a second. Great. Keeps, keeps us balanced. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none. Any public comment on the consent items? Great. Thank you. Uh, let's vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Okay. President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Besiege? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. All right. The motion passes five to zero with two absent. Great. Thank you so much. We will now move on to item six, new employee welcome and introductions. General Manager Logan, if you could please present this item. Uh, yes, thank you, Board President Spreen, commissioners and public. I'm pleased to introduce the two new employees approved at the July 18th commission meeting. After onboarding, both employees attended the August 4th all day organizational planning session. Laura Georgie will deliver a report tonight on one of the projects she joined as a team member in item 14A, website updates and improvements. And then Harmon has already completed an evacuation route project, the Ravensbury Mora project, since joining the team on August 3rd. So I'd like to please have you welcome Laura Georgie, who's sitting over there helping us run the meeting tonight as, as general analyst, and A. Harmon, who is our field manager in the back. Welcome to you, and we're glad to have you, and they're fully on board. All right, and uh, again, hope this meeting is, I don't know if I want to say if it's exciting or not. Maybe we don't want it to be exciting, but uh, thank you for all, for all your help. 
Uh, moving on to item seven, well, that was removed from the agenda under the agenda amendments and changes. So we will move on to item eight, which is the fire chief report. Let's see, item 8A is the monthly fire chief report for July, 2023. And 8B is the Palo Alto Fire Station 8 report for July, 2023. Assistant Fire Chief Glass, if you'd provide those reports for us. Yes, good evening, uh, commissioners, presidents, Breen, members of the public, Brian Glass, uh, County Fire. And I am working on the screen share. Let's see. Okay, can you guys see the screen share okay? Yes. Okay, sorry. All right, um, obviously nothing uh, significant to report that meets our threshold. Um, and typically that's about $15,000 worth of loss for just under that at 13.5 this month. This is due to a vehicle fire on Parisma. Parisma. Uh, it was on July 11th at 8.45 at night. Uh, we had a response from uh, Rescue 74 out of El Monte, Engine 75, Engine 76, and Battalion 74. Uh, for a report of a vehicle fire. It was fully involved, not endangering any vegetation or any structures. Uh, the occupant had self-extricated. Uh, they established the command and began an initial uh, fire attack, developing a water supply to Rescue 74. It was able to be handled by two units, Engine Rescue 74 and Engine 75. Battalion Chief remained at scene, uh, and the incident was eventually turned over to Santa Clara County Sheriff's Deputy 2334. Uh, total call volume so far in 2023 is 539 calls. That's consistent with uh, past trends over the years, taking into account our COVID year 419 in 2020. So you can see we're pretty consistent with where we should be within the fire district. Uh, 90 during the month of July is a little bit higher than what we've seen uh, in the past. But again, we're, we're averaging over the entire year uh, right about where we need to be. Uh, grand total is 90 calls, as I stated, 45 uh, were the uh, EMS, which is typically about 50%. Uh, 28 calls were for service, fire alarms, 11. Fires were three. And just remember, these are calls that are dispatched as a fire. So something that in, uh, possibly has smoke. Uh, and then what we actually find that scene is oftentimes something different. So just remember what we're capturing here is calls that we were dispatched to and not actually what we found when we arrived at scene. Many times it's a pot on the stove or something less hazardous, which is always a positive. Uh, overall response times averaged out looking really good this month, five, five minutes and 37 seconds in our urban density areas and six minutes and 30 seconds in our rural. And just remember, we're looking for 759 in the urban and 1159 or less in the rural. So we're really doing good on response times within this area. Again, the dollar loss component, I discussed that $13,500, and that's related to the damage to the vehicle. And then um, I show the map at the bottom, which is the distribution of calls throughout the fire district. And with that, I'll pause and take any questions that the commissioners or public have uh, on this report before transitioning to the Palo Alto report. Great, thank you. Any commission questions on the uh, overall report? Great, any public questions about the uh, report? Seeing none, great, we will move on to the uh, Palo Alto Station report, thank you. Yeah, um, okay, moving on to the Palo Alto Station report. Um, this is for the month of July. This month was staffed by Santa Clara County Fire uh, and the crews there uh, during their 12 hour shifts uh, for that month on engine 384. There was a total of 13 emergency responses, four were EMS calls, one was a fire call, seven were service calls, and one was an alarm call. Again, happy to, to try to answer questions about this, uh, but uh, this is the report for Palo Alto for the month of July, Station 8 coverage. Excellent, thank you. Uh, any commissioner comments, questions? Seeing none, any public comments, questions on that? Seeing none, great. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate Thanks, your time. Man. Let's see. Uh, we will now move on to item nine, the general manager report. General Manager Logan, would you please provide that report for us? Uh, yes, thank you, Board President Spring. The cover slide of the report, and I think somebody will pick that up for me. There we go. Okay, this cover slide depicts my public comment to the LAFCO Board of Commissioners on August 2nd at the Countywide Fire Service Review Public Hearing. 
I had the opportunity after the meeting to speak with the LAFCO commissioners and staff. Uh, moving to slide two. This summarizes a virtual wildfire and insurance town hall event on July 19th. I will be meeting next week with district, the district director from assembly member Mark Berman's office to discuss wildfire and insurance issues and learn more about assembly member Berman's initiatives and share our Los Altos Hills County Fire District projects, programs and COE um, community outreach and education initiatives. Moving on to slide three. This slide outlines the attachments submitted to the LAFCO consultant and staff in response to the 637 page LAFCO draft countywide fire service review. <clears throat> the district team spent many hours to read and outline the issues raised by the LAFCO report that pertain to Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The results were the Los Altos Hills County Fire District response, our staff comments, presentations at a community meeting, and the public hearing. These documents are attached to the general manager report for the record. The link to the general manager's public comments to the LAFCO Commission on August 2nd are also included in the, in the report. A copy of the comments are included in the document. Moving to slide four. These are questions raised at the July 18th commission meeting pertaining to the LAFCO draft report that references central fire. Santa Clara County Fire Department adopted time standards not meeting published goals was one of the questions. And in response to that, Santa Clara, Central, Santa Clara County Central Fire uh, provided me the information that they are an internationally accredited agency, one of the few in Northern California. As such, to be an accredited fire agency, the published time standards of cover are goals from a five-year data review, which Central Fire does not meet, and that's done intentionally. It's done because they are time standards that County Fire uh, aspires to achieve. These are goals that work toward achieving better response times. So that's the response to the first question. Second question is the LAFCO draft report on money station not meeting standards. Uh, Central Fire provided the information that they looked at criteria like seismic retrofitting, non-gender specific door, dorm separation, confidential separation of offices when reporting out to LAFCO. The office at El Monte Station does not offer much privacy for confidential conversations, nor do the dorms offer full sleeping separation. They sleep in cubicle style situation rather than in closed dorm rooms. El Monte is one of approximately six stations within Central Fire's response service area that has some of these challenges. The next question is errors for truck 74 in the LAFCO report. Uh, Central Fire is aware of the errors to the LAFCO report and is sending corrections. Next question is the low utilization hours for truck 74. The water tender 78 is located at Mount, uh, Monte Sereno. The data shows a very similar deployment frequency as truck 74. The same is true for trucks when Central Fire provided service to Morgan Hill. In the case of truck 74, when a truck is needed in Los Altos or in the identified truck zone within Los Altos Hills County Fire District, it allows that resource with four personnel to arrive on scene much faster than truck 71 coming from Cupertino. The replacement truck 74 will allow a larger geographic truck zone due to the improvements with the truck for angle of departure and turning radius improvement with that truck model. When it comes to rescue operations or ventilation needs, time is absolutely of the essence and critical for the residents of both Los Altos and Los Altos Hills. And then the last question is a request for a map of Palo Alto Station 8 calls. And the response is, this is not a process in place at this time to take Palo Alto GIS information because they have different CAD and RMS systems uh, and input it into the central fire process. So a map would not be forthcoming at this time. And um, I thank you. That's the end of the general manager report. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. And I also appreciate your uh, having brought, uh, brought forth all the questions from last month. And it's very impressive that first slide seeing you up on the giant screens uh, <laughs> presenting, very, very impressive. Any other commissioner comments about on any of these topics? I have one comment. Please. I have one comment and one question. Please. Uh, 
Number one is a question in regards to uh, the timeline that Assemblyman Behrman might have for reaching a, either a, a resolution of the uh, of this insurance, you know, uh, issues, or is there, um, or perhaps any pre presentation of any kind of a that he might have toward the community. I think this is something that is very of much of interest uh, in terms of being insurance is being cancelled and you know being in question all the rest of it. So I was just wondering if you have any ideas or any sense of when that might be. Yes, thank you for that question. What I plan to do is I'm meeting with his uh, director uh, next week, and then we'll go over the questions and his initiatives, and that will help me then tee up the conversation that I'll have with Assemblyman Berman. And um, at the town hall that they had on July 19th, uh, the commissioner, the Department of Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Laura was at that meeting, and I've worked with Ricardo Laura also, as has Jenia Rendler when, or Jenia Woods, when we met with him a couple of years ago before COVID, as I recall. So um, we're going to continue that dialogue. And if any of the commissioners have any kind of, of uh, questions that they would like to ask of uh, Mark Berman, be happy to take those to him and perhaps an invitation that he could speak to the commission at some point in time about his agendas and his initiatives with helping with insurance, because I know it's something that we're all so, so interested in. Mm -hmm and more so now than ever. With, and um, as we see, you know, we're getting into fire season now in uh, August, September, October. So it's really going to be a heightened alert for all of us. Okay. Good timing, but thank, thank you, you for that's that. That's great. I'll, I'll send you this, um, yeah. some issues in, on, on, in email. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the second was the comment I just wanted to make, uh, basically uh, pitching on your, the comment you just made. I think the presentation that uh, General Manager Logan made to the uh, LAFCO uh, board was fantastic. I think the, the two, I think the staff, they did an outstanding job in terms of identifying the issues of that are not, we are not aligned with their way of looking at the issues that, they, that we are looking at it in terms of the, and also the fact that they're not looking at the holistic issue of the uh, a buoy a community like us being in, a, in enmeshed in the, in potential fire issues, uh, they're not looking at that. They're kind of look, seem like looking at it very linearly. So I think that was those two points were very well made by General Manager Logan. Excellent, great, thank you. Appreciate those comments. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, I have a brief comment. I hope it's appropriate. I just wanted to speak on the truck, um, and I think a lot of people don't understand the value of a truck. So I I look at like okay, a Volkswagen Beetle. The fire truck is like a Volkswagen Beetle. It comes out, it's very dependable. It has a limited amount of tools. The truck is not used as much, but the truck has ladders. It has airbags It can lift cars. It has, it has special tripod poles. It can rescue people from a hole, it has all kinds of rope rescue. So pe people look at the truck and they go, well, it just sits there all the time. Well, that's the truck. You want that because it has every it's like the magic toolbox that has everything you may need for the most random bizarre situations i mean we rescued a deer out of a ventilation shaft of a of an office building once i mean <laughs> the, the truck or if a car goes down a cliff it has all the repelling gear to get down and rescue those people from the cliff but people aren't educated on that and, and, it, and it's, it's not their fault that they don't know that but it's i think it's just really important that people know the truck is like a magic tool. It's the magic toolbox that has everything. It's not used a lot, but you want to have that when you need it. And, and that was just my comment. So it's very, very valuable, priceless piece of equipment. Excellent. Thank you. Really appreciate that, that viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I just have a question about um, for the standards that were flagged for the El Mati station, what kind of steps do we take with that information? Is that something we put on future consideration lists or? Yes, so um, the fire chief Kirkout and I have been talking about remodel or how to approach El Monte station. It's something that she knows is very top of mind for the commissioners and for the staff. And we want to do everything possible, but there's so many logistics into planning on how that's going to occur and the limited staff to do it. So it's just a constant renewal and conversation as to how quickly we can get that remodel going. And I think with the gender issues in the bathrooms and in the sleeping quarters, it's perhaps put us in a higher ranking 
than we were before because actually the facility is in pretty good shape. It's just, it doesn't meet the diverse needs of the firefighters that, that reside there as so their it's home. More a space issue. Yeah, and what's more just, just how to, you know, make equal the gender issues that are there. And that's put us, I think it's elevated us up. That's kind of my impression after the conversations with her, but we're one of six. And so um, I don't know, Chief Glass is still on the- um, Yeah, he has Zoom his hand raised. <laughs> if, if he may want to say a few words on that. Chief Glass, the floor is yours, Sam. Uh, thank you, President Spring and um, General Manager Logan. I appreciate it. I just wanted to affirm Commissioner McDonald's, uh, you know, assertions about the truck. And, you know, it is, uh, I, I've never heard it referred to as the magic toolbox, but I, <laughs> I, I do love that term. And we might have to nickname that truck, uh, the magic toolbox moving forward. But uh, it does, and, and I'm happy to speak to it. Again, it, the way that we have the policy set up for our company officers is they get a recommendation from our computer-aided dispatch system for which unit and apparatus that is assigned to the El Monte Fire Station to take. But we delegate that authority because we trust their judgment because they are bid into that station, they know the local area, and they can select which unit they want to respond in. A vast majority of the time, you're seeing the calls that they respond to in Rescue 74 because it's quick, it's maneuverable, it has the ability to deliver service to the vast majority of calls that we respond to. However, there are those unique and special situations where those highly trained individuals can jump over to that vehicle and take that vehicle to the most appropriate type of call. So again, it gives us the ability uh, on the fly in, in the middle of the dispatch to be able to say, no, it's more appropriate to take the truck company with a 103 foot ladder so that we can make access. Or uh, as we heard, you know, uh, someone down in, in a uh, storm drain or a horse that has fallen and been injured, we have the ability to pivot very quickly and bring our large animal rescue tools and equipment as well. So again, I think it's a, a great sentiment to have the commissioner with the knowledge of the use of the truck and just wanna uh, thank him for bringing that forward for the members of the public and members of the commission. Uh, thank you, President Spring. All right. Great, thank you, we appreciate it. Again, that perspective is always illuminating for us. Any other commission comments? Great, any public comments on the general manager report? Um, yes, we have a comment from Alan Epstein. Okay, thank you. Uh, general manager, thank you very much for responding to my questions. Um, my comment about the WAFCO report with regards to the findings on the station is that unfortunately, the consultant that does the work takes the response and puts it into kind of a boilerplate response. And as a result of that, the report recommends a replacement of the facility. It doesn't talk about uh, refurbishment or remodeling to meet needs. It actually talks about planning for replacement. So un unfortunately, the way in which the um, consultant prepares the report from the self-reporting information that provided uh, was provided, I think provides a misleading um, uh, status condition of, of the facility and the needs for its uh, future re remodeling. With regards to the comments about um, providing a map for Palo Alto, I appreciate it that um, when the facility is staffed by Palo Alto, uh, there's an incompatible GS, GIS system, but last month the uh, station was, was staffed by Santa Clara County Fire District and of course, their GIS system has the capability of providing that information. Thanks so much for answering my questions. Great, thank you for the comments. Great, any other public comments? Great, okay. Uh, appreciate the general manager's report. And uh, we will now move on to item 10, the organizational planning session report. Let's see, uh, general manager Logan and the municipal resource group strategic planning consultant Scott will be providing this report right now for us. Uh, thank you, President Spring. Uh, district staff met in person on August 4th, 2023 to conduct the district's first all-day organizational planning session. The intent of the planning session was to align projects and tasks with resource allocated within the budget and priorities identified in the strategic plan. Staff will return to the commission at a future meeting to provide the district work plan for service areas, planning sessions, discussions, also focused on personnel organization and structure, cross-team culture, building infrastructure and sustainability. The attached staff memorandum report 
and PowerPoint report provides additional details about the various service areas which were included, such as integrated hazardous fuel reduction, um, CWPP Annex 4, community outreach, education, firewise communities, risk reduction, finance, IT, personnel, organization, cross-functional teams. In other words, we hit all the high topics in the day. Um, all areas include recognition of regionalization, multi-year strategy, internal, external collaboration, cross-functional teams, vendors, contractors, consultants, partner agencies, GIS technology tools, and partner variables. The next steps are that once staff compiles a draft district work plan from the service area work plans, these will be shared with the ad hoc commission organizational planning subcommittee for review and discussion for a report to the full commission at a future meeting. The near and multi-year work plan will provide a living roadmap, identify staffing, resources, and program enhancements for the fiscal year 23-24 as well as plan through 2027. The district work plan will be a keystone in the development of the fiscal year 24-25 budget process. And just a comment on that, we're already receiving information from County OBA and we're already starting to convene the FY 24-25 budget. So uh, we do both in tandem now, both 23-24 and 24-25. So this organizational work plan was just a keynote at the exact right time with new employees coming on board for us to have this all day planning session. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marcy Scott, who will talk about the PowerPoint presentation and give you some um, visual examples of what we did. Marcy. Great. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Is this on? Doesn't sound like it. Oh, okay. There we go. Thanks so much, General Manager Logan. Good evening, commissioners and all. Um, so I'll just walk through the slides briefly and give you just a little more detail. Um, so you can see the rapt audience here um, paying attention to the presentations and I'll give you some of the content in the presentations, but they were really quite good. Um, so the next slide shows the agenda and we won't walk through this, but it was a very full agenda and you know, we don't get to meet in person very often, so that was nice. And there tends to be discussion, um, and we had a hard start and a hard stop. But this is a disciplined group, and we were able to get through all the topics. Um, you may have seen in the picture there was a referee there. Um, but the good news is there were no penalty flags thrown. So um, we did work through this. Um, next slide, please. Um, we did. Uh, begin with um, some commission comments at the beginning of the day. And that provided sort of a historical perspective of the district. And that was really helpful to the staff. Sorry, Corey, can we go back one slide? I jumped ahead too quickly. Um, so at the start, we had this historical perspective. At lunchtime, we had another commissioner comments that really kind of challenged the group um, to say, how are you gonna get all this work done? Um, and then we had another commissioner comment at the end and provide sort of an overview closing comments. And the um, participants really felt these comments were a highlight and provided great context for the session. And I know that because every participant filled out a survey. And so I reviewed the summary results um, and there was a strong consensus that they appreciated having the commission perspective. Uh, so that was very helpful. Um, and so next, we'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. And we had specific objectives to get through in the session, um, really getting an overall knowledge about the work at the district in the different subject areas was very helpful. And each of the leaders of those areas provided their own work plan and timeline and walked through it in quite good detail. Um, then we also talked about the organization and how it's evolving to meet the coming work plan. Um, we were able to have some time for fun at lunch and do a creative exercise, which was actually quite helpful. We had some good thinking and creative thinking. Um, and then we also talked about really understanding the how and why of the work plans and what those deliverables and timelines will look like. Um, 
Okay, and the next slide. So this, uh, if I'm going to focus on the blue column there, and uh, it's a little bit of small print, but what this shows is the topic areas that were covered. And we start at the top, which was the first presentation by Russ on the budget, um, short-term and long-term financial planning, and technology resources. And that was a great foundation to start the presentations. It really talked about the resources. Um, next, we had Eugenia presenting the integrated hazardous fuel reduction programs and helping us see the big projects that are coming. And she had a map that really showed the whole district and how these projects work within the whole realm of the district. So that's a coming attraction is showing that visual aid for you. Um, and next we had Victoria presenting about our um, outreach and um, education community outreach and education programs, which are really showing tremendous growth. Um, and Denise spoke about the risk reduction programs, specifically FireWise, the fire access roads, um, and other programs, as well as some new work that is being contemplated in working with some of our adjacent tech companies and make some inroads there. Um, Jay then also spoke about the hydrants as we're a unique organization that own the hydrants, over 500 hydrants. And again, really helpful context for the new employees and the whole range of employees. Um, and Jay and I then talked about the personnel organization and the strategic plan and how that all fits in together. Um, we also talked about the work culture and the evolution that's occurring in the staffing planning to really move into cross-functional teams. Um, we tend to work um, in the past on specific topic areas, but now we're seeing the benefit of having these cross-functional teams that will work across lines a little more. And I think with the skills, knowledge, and ability of the staff, um, that will really generate some synergy. And that sort of gets us to our, our next topic, which we also wanted to identify general trends that are gonna impact the district in the next five years. And I think there are two key words that really get to that. One is, is syn synergy, um, where the overall whole is stronger, faster, better than the individual pieces. Um, and so we're thinking about new ways to work together and how to combine programs and use our services we're offered to expand our programs. And, and to explain that further, um, that gets um, to our second word, which is integration. And um, as President Spreen mentioned at the start of the meeting, we are reminded time and again of um, the challenges communities face um, in terms of protecting and moving people, property, and pets in a time of crisis. And the work that we do to support our mission can't be any more important than supporting those capabilities. And we're finding ways to integrate our programs um, with the projects we have coming up. And specifically, for example, you're probably familiar with our chart of services. This is what explains the work the district does. And in the integrated hazardous fuel reduction programs here, we have a variety of services we offer to our residents, like the chipping program. That's expanding and growing every quarter. Also the um, HIZ, the home ignition zone inspections. Well, we're finding that when we're doing an evacuation route program, we're engaging with residents and neighbors Sometimes it's through the um, entry um, paperwork, but they engage with us and they say, how can I help? How can I work on my property? Well, it's through using the chipping program. It's through using the HIZ. Also um, through the FireWise meetings in the communities and the neighborhoods, the same kind of discussions are happening and people really wanna know what can I do? And we have these programs that we can offer. And so we're finding ways to, to incorporate these programs into the projects that we're doing. So 
those are the kinds of things we're thinking about moving forward and that we will be putting in these work plans. So um, as, as the general manager mentioned, we have individual work plans. We're now going to combine them into one fiscal year 23-24 work plan um, that we'll bring to the ad hoc committee for review, comment, and then bring to the full commission for your review and comment. And we'll also look out to 2027, the end of the strategic plan, to think about how our programs and projects will move through that period of time as well. Um, so that um, completes our presentation. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, we'd be happy to respond. Thank you. Any, any commissioner comments? I'll make one comment that uh, I feel like I was very lucky to uh, see a very rare sighting of all our staff around one big table, which of course is, as for those listening in uh, with the public, we don't have facilities. So this is a very rare thing to have everyone in one place. And I wish I could bottle up the inspiring feeling it was to see this incredibly powerful group of people who were totally focused and motivated on ac action around that table. So I was, again, I, I feel I was lucky to experience that. And I hope that the, uh, the public gets a sense of that as time goes on about how much this group is focused on getting stuff done. So it was a great meeting for the 15 minutes I was there. Uh, it was inspiring. But, uh, hey, do we have any public comments uh, on this report? Great. Yes. Do we have a comment from Alan Epstein? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for uh having this meeting and, and I look forward to seeing um, the results of the meeting and through the various programs. I just have one question and as it relates to fire detection technology and whether the district intends to do anything in that area and, and um, anything about fire, fire notification, as we all know, um, the notifications in Hawaii were, were ineffective and uh, um, maybe there should be more concentration on on efforts to notify people because these uh, wildfires can move extraordinarily fast. So thanks so much for having the meeting. Look forward to seeing the results and would appreciate your um, looking into those two issues. Thank you. Great, thank you. A very relevant question and uh, we, will, we will talk about that and uh, provide some information in the future. On, uh, I know I, I will say one thing, I know that we've, uh, in my email I received a number, there's always new detection companies doing things. So it's quite a broad industry of things. And fortunately, I do know that um, the fire department here actually is quite on top of these various technologies and which ones are relevant and which ones are not. So I really trust them to sort of uh, to have that as part of their uh, issue. But the notification one is part of the entire emergency planning and emergency uh, issues. You know, And that's been changing over these years what used to be all uh, uh, ham radio is now cell phones and, and other things. So I think I'm sure that will get a lot of attention after the Hawaii issue. Um, and it's something that is, we're all going through a change of technology for that right now. So a very relevant question. And I just wanna say that about it. Okay, moving on to item 11, reports on district fire hydrants. Uh, this is going to be a report given to us by Friar and I always mispronounce this. Friar and Loretta, engineering consultant Tarantino, if you could provide us a report uh, on various aspects of uh, hydrants that have occurred over the past few weeks. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, President Spreen. And Loretta, you got it pretty close. So that's, that's good. That's, that's better than I did when I first started working here. So that's admirable. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Um, so tonight I'm going to first uh, for item 11A uh, included in your board packets was uh, was a memorandum that Friar and Loretta prepared. Um, General Manager Logan and I had been speaking about, um, you know, the history of, uh, of the on-call services agreement and the success that we've had with that agreement and reducing the time and effort required to respond to emergency conditions. It also provided a vehicle um, on the screen here. The image on the left is the new ballers that were installed around the hydrant at Altamont and Black Mountain Road. This is the hydrant that has been struck twice uh, since December 2020. And having the, um, the on-call services agreement has provided us with an opportunity to be able to um, improve protection for this critical hydrant. 
Um, the image on the right um, is the hydra. This is an outdated picture. Apologies to the commission. I didn't um, have a, a, a photo of the uh, the hydrant at the Seaton property that this is a new hydrant installed in collaboration with the Person Hills Water District as part of what they called their depths project. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that was identified after the hydrant was installed and in, in, in communication with the Seaton property managers was that this, this hydrant was positioned such that, that it, it potentially had a higher risk of being struck from a vehicle backing out of a parking spot. We had spoken at the June meeting uh, uh, that the um, this hydrant had directly across the street. There are several parking spots for visitors parking, and the concern is that when somebody's backing out, they may not notice the hydrant and they could strike it. So two bollards installed approximately in the location shown in the in this image um, were installed um, recently as, as part of the completion of the um, uh, Prisma Hills Depths Project collaboration. And so when when as we talk about in the memo, there's there's two different methodologies that that the district uh, leverages to provide the hardening projects, either collaborative collaboratively with the Prison Hills Water District, and even in those collaborations where our teams are working together through the design process to look at um, potential relocated uh, hydrant locations, new fire hydrant locations. Um, occasionally during construction, we find that there's um, another opportunity to improve the hardening and protection of a hydrant, like we did with the depths project. And so um, the person of Hills was kind enough to, to work with us and work with their contractor to, to add as a change order um, installation of two bollards in a, in a pretty cost effective way. Um, but one of the advantages of the on-call agreement, um, if, if the commissioners will remember and um, when FNL first joined uh, providing services in, in mid 2020 through about June of 21, anytime there was a hydrant struck, um, we, we would have to go through um, sometimes an informal, but it was still a bid process where FNL um, working with the uh, district staff and, and county council will put together a package for soliciting bids from, from contractors. Um, and then we would select the lowest responsive bidder and, and award that could execute that contract. And then the work would be done. And generally we were seeing um, from the time of a notification of a, of a hydrant strike to when the work was complete, sometimes six to eight weeks. Um, and as we all know, that's just, um, you know, really a, a long time to be out without uh, even, even one hydrant. And so the on-call agreement has created the opportunity to continue to manage risk, um, respond to emergencies in a significantly more timely manner and address um, a potential reduction in uh, temporary reduction in fire protection so that we can replace these hydrants. And in fact, this week, this past weekend, a hydrant was struck on Saturday evening on Elena Road. Um, Monday morning, we were notified by Person Hills. Uh, the FNL team did our inspection yesterday. And just before the commission meeting, we've, we've now notified the contractor, on-call contractor, to go ahead and go out there. And um, fortunately, it's a simple, simple repair. Just have to replace the break-off spool and then reinstall the hydrant. The hydrant itself was not damaged. Uh, everything functioned properly. There was uh, no, no significant leaks. Um, the check valve functioned properly. And so, you know, our goal is within seven calendar days to have that hydrant reinstalled. And, and, and I, I believe we'll, we'll, we'll meet that goal, if not improve upon it a little bit with this, with this most recent event. So with that, I'll hit pause and happy to answer any questions about item 11A. Any questions from the commission? Seeing none, uh, I'll take any public, do you want to take, let's see, uh, since you're separate, let's take all well, any public comments on 11A. Great, okay, let's go ahead, let's move forward. Great. 11B is an update on another, the next collaboration project with the Person Hills Water District. They are in the design phase um, for their I-280 and Liticote resiliency project. Um, the design is ongoing. Um, we are in communication with P, uh, personal health staff and their design consultant. Um, we do not we do not have a design plans to review yet, but we would expect those coming in sometime later in the year. Um, during the initial planning stages from Persima Hills, um, there was a, a discussion amongst um, some of the residents on Radcliffe Lane, which is which was within the, the work area of the proposed um, residency project. And there is a plan to modify the, or to replace an existing fire hydrant that's at the end of Radcliffe Lane. Radcliffe Lane is uh, kind of at the edge of the um, uh, Prisma Hills and, and fire districts uh, service area. And the residents were concerned about what the plan was to, to replace that hydrant. Um, and so the district staff, we've been communicating with the residents. 
Um, we are working with First Amendment Hills to look at opportunities to um, replace the, the Radcliffe Lane hydrant with actually two different hydrants, um, to that which we believe will, pro will likely provide an overall better um, uh, fire protection for, for the area and take advantage of the improved fire flows that the First Amendment Hills project is projected to, to provide to the system. Um, we will be meeting with the residents um, through a, a virtual meeting uh, next Thursday, August 24th, to provide the, the residents with an update uh, on, the, on the project, um, our next steps in collaboration with uh, Person Hills Water District, and answer any questions or concerns the staff ha may have. Uh, General Manager Logan and Chief Gluhan and Chief Cronin will be attending the meeting uh, with me so that we can provide both you know, my kind of simple engineering explanation about what we're doing, and then um, uh, Chief Gluhan and Chief Cronin will be able to uh, provide uh, responses to questions and concerns about, about how the, the changing of the fire hydrant there may will, will um, impact fire protection, which in our opinion, is actually our, our proposed strategy to, to install two new hydrants will actually improve things over existing conditions. So with that, I will happy to take any questions on this item. Any comments or questions here? It's pretty straight, pretty direct. Thank you. Any public comments on that? I wouldn't expect that, but great. Thank you. Moving on to 11C. Great. And then finally, um, the collaboration with the town on their uh, uh, proposed 2023 uh, paving project. Um, if the commissioners will recall back in June, we provided an update in this project at the time the, the, the town had decided to uh, reject the initial bid prices and then issued the project for rebid. Ultimately, the changes that they made to the scope of their paving project did not change the potential um, uh, uh, interface with the with the with the um, fire district's uh, fire hydrant valve. So, so just as a reminder, when the district perform, or excuse me, when the town performs their paving projects, depending on the type of paving that that is done, uh, we will have to, uh, in some areas, raise the valve covers for the uh, fire hydrant valves. So as part of the 2023 project, uh, there is a proposed uh, two inch mill and overlay where they'll essentially take off the old, you know, top two inches of the old asphalt and put new asphalt down, uh, likely changing the total elevation of the, um, of the road slightly. And so we will be contracting directly with Agurity Paving, who is the town's contractor to, to modify the uh, height of, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be uh, up to five, uh, district valve, uh, valve covers, uh, the, the town is considering extending the limits of the paving on, on, um, Persima Road, which will add potentially one more, more hydrant, uh, it's commissioner sure recall, uh, in June, we discussed that there was only four hydrant valves in this case, with the extension of the paving project, we anticipate there'll be five total valves, um, that will be, um, that will be impacted. Um, the, the final pricing will be, um, within the general manager's authority, um, and so we'll report back at a future meeting on the final completion of the work. Um, at this point, I do not have a proposed start date for the work. Uh, there is a pre-construction meeting, which uh, FNL staff will attend on behalf of the district next week. Um, at that time, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about the project, but I would anticipate the work will, will be completed uh, through the fall, um, consistent with previous year's paving work. With that, happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Any questions to the commissioners? It's, again, pretty direct and straightforward. Any, any public comments, questions? Seeing none. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the detail on that. No problem. Okay. Uh, let's see. We will be moving on to item 12A, emergency services, projects, programs, and events. And this will be uh, two people providing this report. This will be emergency services manager, Victoria Beebe, and project specialist, Corey Beebe. Take it away. Thank you. Good evening, President Spreen, Vice President Sherlock, commission staff and public. Today, I put together an exciting report, I think. Um, we're going to start our report with our recent activities and projects since our last commission meeting, and then we'll end with a six month summary encompassing January through June, 2003. Um, our first report, uh, District Project Specialist BB, will you please present your report on the defensible space model?
Any questions or comments from questioners? Huh? What, was the, what was the toughest thing about the project? Definitely getting the staff done. Mm -hmm. um, had some issues with it with the company that we consulted to uh, get it attached. And some issues with the base board and just kind of getting the physical bottom part together. But other than that, everything ran pretty smooth. And it's in a form that's fairly portable so it can be used uh, easily and uh, taken from event to event? Yeah, um, it's got a handle on it as well as a lock. So when you pull this out, you can just pull it out and it will just click on the lock. You can pull it out and pull it up. Granted, it is a little bit heavy and it kind of puts it in place, but it's really easy to just go in and pull it over. <laughs> Great, thank you. So, uh, it is, like I said, it is a little heavy, but it won't take long to uh, take it over and out. Right. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you. No other comments. So, appreciate it. Thank you for your for your time and, and uh, efforts in helping the group. Thank you. So, so this will be the last time we're going to see him. Is that right? Yes, uh, Special Projects BB is going to college. Okay. So yes, we will. Uh, he'll still be around, as we'll talk about later. Okay. Um, there's also some different foliage, uh, magnetic foliage that Corey has made, um, and uh, Chief Chief Cronin also helped make some um, 3D imaging with um, some uh, an ADU. Uh, what else did you make? You made some garbage cans. We've got fences, sorry, garbage recycling containers. Um, so Corey, would you be willing to set that up in the back so people can, people can kind of play with it later? Yeah, it would be great for you guys to check it out. Um, thank you for your, for your work on that. We're excited to use it. Is it too late to request goats? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's never too late, never too late. Great idea, wow, look at that. Great. Awesome. Great. Thank you. We appreciate your summer. Thank you. Since we have a photographer here tonight, we will get some excellent shots of this demonstration for uh, your community outreach and education brochures and, and materials. That would be great. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Yes, indeed. Our next update on the next slide, please, Corey, is what the communications team has been <laughs> working on. Staff member Constantine, um, many of you should have gotten a newsletter. Our new newsletter focuses on back to school preparedness. Um, it highlights making plans for family and includes an invitation to attend our upcoming Be Ready, Be Prepared for Wildfire class this coming weekend on August 19th from 10 to 12. We've also been working on the final editing for a new district door hanger. This will be finalized and printed in the next few weeks. We're planning to use this door hanger um, for visits to houses that are in the project planning areas on evacuation route projects. Explain the district staff has stopped by to discuss upcoming evacuation route hardening projects. Also for any district staff residents, um, staff that visits residents um, when we have complaints of um, vegetation or home hardening hygiene visits. So you can see that um, on the right hand side of this slide right here as well. Um, and we are still in process of our Firewise booklet um, with revision number two. Next slide, please. Last night, our CERT and teen CERT volunteer groups were um, 
Here, uh, attending an active shooter class, we worked in conjunction with the sheriff's office in the town of Los Altos Hills to um, do a, a refresher on active shooter. We discussed the actions to take when you're involved in an active shooter incident. Um, and just to clarify that CERT will not be activated to respond to an active shooter event. Um, they will be um, potentially asked to help when I call it, well, we call it the cold zone, I call it the Arctic zone because they will not get anywhere near an active incident, but they could potentially, if we have uh, mass casualties, be involved in doing some medical care. Um, it was very well received and we had a request to um, extend it out to the town residents. So we'll be doing that in the future, but um, we had about 20 participants. We had 15 certs and 15 certs. So, and some people I haven't seen out for a couple of years. So um, it, was, it was really, really well attended and a great collaboration. Next slide, please. So it was a busy weekend. On Saturday, we graduated. We had our, uh, some, how many, we had 10 teen certs and one amazing adult district staff member Brand new, already a cert in her first two weeks, general <laughs> analyst, Laura Giorgi. So wow. exciting. Yes. We should also clap because she did put up with 10 teens while she was going through the academy and she did a great job. She blended right in. It was amazing. Um, great group of kids. Um, even the rescue uh, crew that was here really complimented the this group of, of kids and was very impressed by their motivation and their engagement. Um, and I think it's due to all the instructors that we had. Um, we have been working hard at collaborating. And I think I've talked about it a little bit um, within the county with our training with CERT. So we had representation at this Teen CERT Academy from Santa Clara County Fire the Sheriff's Office, Saratoga CERT, Campbell CERT, San Jose CERT, and the City of Mountain View. Um, CERT, as well as um, one of their PD emergency services managers. So as we do these, we have more and more interest. We also had a council member from the city of Hillsboro come with her husband because she heard about our program at the National CERT Conference. And they are um, super excited. They've been talking about doing this for a while and they were just like, wow, to actually see this play out is pretty amazing. Um, so um, just another great event. Um, and I'm just so thankful to everyone for coming out and helping. Um, uh, Chief uh, Cronin and Chief Gluen were there doing um, some great medical ops as well. So it's great to have them and um, as always a good weekend. So we'll continue to um, have these. I'm hoping to have another one in January um, and do a, a, a weekend. So wish me luck on doing an entire Teen Start Academy on a weekend. Woo, someone bring me some coffee. Okay. Now we're going to go to the really exciting part of our report. Here is our emergency services management summary from January 2023 to June 2023. Um, we're going to be discussing our emergency ops operations, our emergency preparedness training and events, volunteer programs, and emergency preparedness education and messaging. And we're going to wrap up with some website analytics. So next slide, please, Corey. As many of you know, we've had quite a dynamic first three months in the emergency services arena um, due to a series of atmospheric river events that brought record-breaking precipitation, that's a big word for me, wind and snow. Um, this chart, and thank you to um, General Analyst uh, Laura Georgia. I hope you guys like the new slide template that she made for me. Um, we were trying to figure out how to easily show um, kind of where, where our first several months were when it comes to um, some of our responses. Um, this is a rough estimate of the emergency operation days um, that happened with each of our events that we had. Um, next slide, please. Events, so next slide, please, Corey. We have, um, we kind of kind of took out a little bit different titles to some of our events. So we call this our emergency preparedness events. Um, because of the inclement weather, our event season didn't really start until about April. Um, so we, I'm pretty proud of us to be able to, to squeeze in for um, great presentations or emergency preparedness events. And you can see our number of attendees here. Next slide, please. Community events, um, we consider those events that we do uh, alongside either the town or other agencies. Um, we did put in our district-led event for a Rastadero bike tour. Um, and this is uh, just a synopsis of what we, what we attended and um, the events that we, that we uh, put on. Next slide will be messaging. Oh no, sorry, 13 cert. Sorry, Corey, keep going. 
So um, we are really um, excited to say that we've we've had seven new certs that have been um, added on to our growing cert program. Um, we did activate our certs once. Um, I don't believe that they've ever really been activated. So we did activate them on January 11th for um, some damage assessment and inclement weather. Um, we've had five CERT skill building events in collaboration with Santa Clara County Fire, um, as well as um, some of the events that we've put on ourselves. And then we've had CERT presence at three events um, so far this year. Next slide. Digital and print media summary. This is our communications group. So social media newsletter metrics here, I'm not gonna read everything, but um, we have 43 new followers. We've reached 5K, which is pretty cool. Um, and our district newsletter, we've uh, increased our subscriber growth by 5%. Um, we have an open rate of 64%. And I thought that's pretty amazing too. What we've done with this format is we've also utilized this format in our CERT communications for um, requests for volunteers, as well as uh, signing up for events. So we were able to utilize um, this format and um, I hope you guys like the new format that we have. Next, please. We also have done a couple of print advertisements. Um, as you can see here, these are um, the finals that we um, have put into the Living in Los Altos Hills magazine. And that was in March, late March. And then in late April, we did the Spring and Home magazine. Next page, maybe the next slide. Newspaper articles, um, we had two, um, our goats, um, what a cool goat picture. Um, the goats arrive at LH to munch away fire risk. And we also have um, some wildfire preparedness um, article that we uh, were involved in too. Next slide. Now we're on the fun stuff, district website analytics, which you're all waiting for. So um, I was pleasantly surprised. We've got new users uh, to the website, 5,273, not bad. Uh, page views, 20,000. And we didn't change too much with our popular pages. As you can see here, um, commission meetings, defensible space, brush chipping, um, contact us. So um, you'll see another report of how we utilize this to change and reorganize our website just a little bit based on what we saw um, with some of these analytics. Next slide, please. These are some observations that um, uh, I think she's called Special Projects Henricks. I don't remember her actual title, so excuse me for that, um, have kind of put together. And we found that um, kind of the top three reasons that people visit our site are defined meeting information, current program signups and information and contact information. Um, so it looks like also um, visitors are spending slightly more time on each page than they were before. So, you know, we're moving, we're moving up in the world here. Um, page views did increase from 14,000 to 20,000. So as we continue to look at these analytics, um, it helps us to form our, our next um, changes to the website and our work plan for the 24, 25 year um, as we continue through this. That I believe is the end of my report. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Any comments, questions? Oh, everyone here. I just thought that yeah, this really caught my eye reading this ahead of time. It, it engaged me. Your slides and the content was very information rich. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Team effort for sure. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, any public comments or questions? Seeing none. Great. Thank you so much, um, both of you. And we'll move on to item 12. B, is that correct? Yes. Uh, community education and risk reduction programs, projects, and events. This will be uh, coming from Community Education and Risk Reduction Manager Gluen, if you would provide this report. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity, President Spring, Vice President Sherlock, uh, other commissioners, staff, public, everyone. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to start first with uh, just my uh, kind of monthly report, and then I'll uh, do my annual report on Firewise, which is a new um, item, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, a um, presentation I was involved with last week, uh, last Wednesday. So next slide. So one of the things I wanted to let you know, as in everything, when something is working, they sell it and change its name. <laughs> 
So Zone Haven Aware, all that marketing we did around that and all county fires marketing, it's now Genesis Protect. So if you have a little bit of trouble finding Zone Haven Aware, because Denise said, just look up your address on Zone Haven Aware. Well, uh, try Genesis Protect. They've done a pretty good job of linking it together, but um, these are the types of things, messages you might get if you go to try to search for your address on Zone Haven. Hmm. Uh, still will work the same. It'll still be the same platform. Again, that it just is uh, changing its name. Next slide. Okay, you've seen this slide before. Add a little bit. We have two recognized firewise now in Los Altos Hills. Uh, we have a new one uh, end of... Uh, July or mid-July uh, that we have recognized. It's on um, the opposite side, the uh, east side. Yeah, there you go. The east side of the 280 freeway. Um, they actually named themselves uh, Zone 33. So um, they really embraced the Zone Haven concept and uh, took it. Uh, we have three in an active process. Obviously, one of those was green, moved to a red, is completed. And then we have three in the pipeline. I have a double one up in the 31 because I've already given one presentation, but I have another presentation scheduled. So I'm not sure if those will meld into one group or if that'll stay two separate. That's one of the options. We can have multiple uh, Firewise communities inside one zone. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Next slide. Okay, I just wanted to give you uh, just again, a general uh, Firewise update. Uh, the total Firewise completed is two. Um, we have the three in process, and these are the names. Uh, Bird Lane might be having a new name. I just haven't gotten what their updated name is going to be, what they've selected. Um, and then we have some that are still sitting in the pipeline. Uh, they're either in various stages of getting a, a committee together, or they need to go back and maybe have a little assistance. Uh, summer kind of was busy for people, so maybe we need to go back and kind of say, hey, how you doing? How can we support you? I have some upcoming meetings in September. Again, I'm going, uh, the Dawson Court and Rebecca Lane are the same area. I did a presentation with the Neighborhood Watch with the Sheriff Deputy um, a couple weeks ago, and I'm going back to do a more in-depth. Ironically, the property that we're having it on is one of the properties that had arson last year. So that would be an interesting conversation, I think. So one of the person hosting it had, um, at the bottom of their property, evidently had a fire. And then some recruitment targets. So all those zones that are listed there, those are zones that we'd like to get some activity in that we currently do not. So I just wanted to give you those and there's little pictures of them. So if you happen to know that you live in one of those, reach out. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned that I'd gone to this presentation last week. Um, I was asked uh, through um, the South Bay Firewise um, group that there is that that's kind of a better practice group. Um, the presenters were from uh, Fire Safe Council of the Santa Cruz County, Lynn Sestak and Lizanne Jensen did a really good job on um, attempting to touch a very taboo subject. Um, we never want to talk about staying in the event of a fire as we've seen there's high potential for loss, especially recently. Um, in the recent fires, um, getting out is the best option always. Um, but that being said, uh, we always want to look at preparing ourselves mentally and as much as we can physically uh, for the possibility. So that was the discussion topics. Um, alongside my invitation, uh, we had uh, Robert Gray, who's the chief of the Felton Fire Protection District, and then unit chief uh, Nate Armstrong from Cal Fire. He's in the San Mateo area. And I think one of the key terms that I the key terms that I wanted to kind of clarify that shelter in place, and you can hear this also when you have um, say a hazmat spill, where they say shelter in place. If you you know lived up in the the areas that have the refineries, they do a lot of training around that. Versus stay and defend, and stay and defend is the person that refuses to evacuate and wants to stay and protect their home. Very much different. The shelter in place is a last resort. Um, frequently, it'd be a um, Maybe an opportunity to leave was reduced by a tree falling down, power lines, something that cut them off and either staying in their car or returning back to their home maybe was an only option. That might be a, a component of why. A fast moving fire with little or no notification. Uh, that was definitely Santa Rosa. Um, so these were kind of some of the best chance surviving uh, tactics that you might be able to use. Options if you had to change locations and then the aftermath of the fire going through and what that would look like. 
And just on a little bit less sombering note, I am doing a presentation to tomorrow night in Santa Cruz County, virtually again, around goats. So I'm going to talk about, To we did say, is there any goats on the map? I'm doing that tomorrow evening. I was requested through our website, one of those unique uh, visits. Someone called me up and, and asked me their uh, the land use in Santa Cruz County. So they want to get some information on that. So I'll talk a little bit about that next time. And just to finish off, as Victoria said, be ready, be prepared. Uh, swag bag, you get a little uh, gift if, per household if you attend. It's Saturday at 10. You get a little uh, kit with some stuff in it, a little first aid kit, and this cool little bag uh, to put it all in. So that's the concept of having everybody be prepared with a go bag, we help them get started. So that's the end of my presentation. If there's any, oh, sorry, I forgot my annual report. Let me finish that one. Okay, so this is new. I forgot, it's so new, I forgot. Um, I tried to throw something together. I wasn't sure exactly how you make this detail interesting because it's, it's dynamic. I mean, it's kind of a one and done. Once they get recognized, it's keeping them in the renewal process. But this kind of gives you, I just did a little spreadsheet on, we kind of started basically the Firewise stuff intensity was around April 23rd. That's when we had that volunteer dinner here in this uh, location. Out of that, you can see the different uh, Firewise that happened in May. Then we hit the town picnic. We got some more traction. Uh, so then you can see what happened in June. Uh, we ended this, uh, this reporting cycle the 1st of July. So we've only really had about a 10 week period but in that results, 150 unique in-person educational um, contacts with residents. So that means actual education with 150 different people, a minimum. There's more obviously with picnics and, and the volunteer dinner. But, uh, and then again, just a synopsis like you've kind of seen up through the end of um, June was the six, uh, six meetings in that month, two steering committee meetings, one renewal check-in meeting, and then some additional meetings. So that's the end of my report. Great, thank you. I'll, before I ask for comments, uh, I saw that the video from the sheltering, shelter in place was put, up, was put up on the web and I've watched that and it indeed is very sobering as to a reminder of why not to be lackadaisical when things are happening because it uh, it's worth watching just to kind of re-scare you about why you do not want to just hang out and not take these things seriously. But, um, any other comments or questions on this? Oh, yes, Jim. Yeah, I was just going to ask a question. Is there a chance that the uh, shelter in place can be presented in one of these Saturday meetings or whatever to the community, or is it just too much of a taboo topic? Oh, no, no. I, I, think, um, I think eventually what I, I would anticipate is as fire-wise communities annually need an educational event, and that would be the appropriate time maybe to introduce that. The recording's available for anyone to watch. Yeah. It's not my presentation, so we would request the speakers to come and present. It's a work in prog progress for them. It's the first time they've presented it. They're definitely looking for input. There's really no right answer. You know, we can only make predictions on as many scenarios as we can, you know, imagine. So again, it's looking at your own property, doing your own home hardening. I explained to people when they're uh, learning about Firewise that you're making a temporary refuge for your home mm -hmm. in doing your property um, hygiene and your home hardening. So if the worst case scenario happens where you can't get out, that you've done everything to make your home a temporary refuge possibly for yourself. And again, it's temporary refuge. It's not a, it's, it's not a planned event. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's that's pretty much a, a implied assumption that when you're doing that with your home, that is you're going to be a shelter in place. But what I'm what I'm trying to really get at is as if this this might be a wake up call for people who are not are not really aware enough to to undertake the uh, the efforts to to get to that point. Yeah, and I, I will just say something interesting that came out was new for me. I I have been. Uh, in my presentations talking about pulse point as one of the options to kind of pay attention, especially red flag days. You know, I said, it's a really good time to monitor pulse point, turn the notifications on, but we used it even today. Um, Watch duty is another one that I had just downloaded last Wednesday because of the presentation. I thought, let me try it out. And I got a notification. Harmon had actually um, alerted us too along the, the fire, not here in Los Altos Hills, but in the Santa Clara County. Um, so it was, it was interesting. Uh, you can sign up multiple counties. So I have three counties that I observe. So it's, it's another way to be situationally aware 
It's on the resident to be situation aware. That's the two ways out, having your plans, having your go bag, you know, and, and using that uh, situational awareness to know, you know, signing up for alert, early alerts as part of that planning. So thank you. Thank you. Any other com questions, comments? Any public questions or comments? Great. Thank you. We appreciate um, Moving on to item, uh, let's see, this is 12B3. Uh, this is the HIZ program semi-annual and monthly report. I think that's right. This would be, <laughs> this would be operations project manager Russell providing this report. Ooh, it's not the... Good evening, commissioners, staff, and public. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting over here. Um, so that is actually, those are not the slides. We've, oh, B3, are we on the right? They're a little different, but that's okay. I can adjust. Yeah, yep. they're a little bit different than that. So um, what I will do is I will start off with uh, providing a report. I started with the semi-annual report. And that looked at, you're not going to actually see that on this slide, but it looked at January through June. And the Fire Safe Council provided us with the statistics on the number of assessments and rebate eligible uh, requests that we received. And we request, the requests were 10. And you will see on the graph that I created, <laughs> that's not up there, um, you would see that in January and February, there were absolutely zero HIZs. And I think that makes sense given the weather we had and people aren't quite in the mindset yet to be doing the, their fuel reduction projects. Um, and then it started to pick up a little bit and we had six in June, which coincided with our San Antonio Hills outreach. We sent 1100 postcards at that time and not as big a bump as we thought we would get, but we got six people. So it was a total of eight folks, eight, 10 in total for that entire six month period, but eight people actually followed through, had their assessments and uh, some started with their uh, the rebate program. And then uh, it got very exciting. So from there, I wanted to actually give you the look at how we're doing um, given our, our uh, the other months. So July, we had 28 in total. And then August so far, we have 37 in total. So it's really picking up. We did a second outreach to the San Antonio Hills by sending them postcards again. And then um, I'm sort of in a little sort of uh, unspoken competition with Captain Gluhan here. She has 13 Firewise and I had 10 San Antonio Hills folks, but then I went out on uh, into the field with Captain Cronin this last week for the evacuation route. And I found six people that signed up. So it put me ahead by just a little bit. Uh, the <laughs> takeaway there is that it's not actually a competition, but that face that face to face interaction that we have with our residents is fantastic. There's just, you know, I mentioned, did you get the postcard? Mm, I don't think I did. <laughs> then I would explain the program. Okay, sign me up. And I would just sign them up right there. So um, the more, I think, in-person interaction we have, I think that's the takeaway. That's going to be really exciting moving forward. So that is the end of my report. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Well, I'll make a comment because I understand the nature of competition and how it can be a positive <laughs> thing. Because, you know, on the previous uh, presentation that uh, Captain Gluhan gave, she mentioned the Firewise communities. And so I had this conversation with the council member, Lisa Schmidt, and I said, Lisa Schmidt, I am setting up a neighborhood watch. And she said, I'm setting up a neighborhood watch and a Firewise community. I thought, oh. and I said, well, at my event, I'm serving sparkling wine. And she said, I serve dinner. <laughs> but, you know, I think there's something to be said for this. The, the personal connection, you, the town sends out a mailer and it's me working on neighbors who know other neighbors and getting them to contact it's kind of one by one. So I just appreciate how it's kind of a hard slog, but a little competition is not a bad thing if it inspires good things. I agree. And it helps when you don't tell your race partner that you're actually in a competition. Yeah. <laughs> Take every I've heard of tonight, challenge accepted. And Lisa <laughs> said to me in that meeting, and we were there with the sheriff and she, afterwards she said, 
am I the first council member to have a firewise <laughs> community started? So she was, she hasn't told you that it was on until just then. So <laughs> she knows that kind of sneak attack also. Thanks. Well, it's tough life up here at the dais. You got to watch out and watch your back. Great. Thank you. This isn't being recorded, is it? <laughs> <laughs> the gauntlet has been put, has been thrown down. Uh, any other public comments on, on this report? Nope. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving along to, let's see, uh, 12B4. This is going to be the presentation of the process flow chart for hazardous weeds, brush, and or rubbish abatement from uh, technical analyst project manager Cronin. Good evening, President Spreen. Oh, wow. May I have our microphone on? Oh, you turn off up here. There you go. Is it on now? Yes. Is it on now? Is it? We'll give it a try. Can we confirm it's actually on? It's Do I need to press and hold it? I think I think that's just a release. That's not a mic. Oh well, go for it anyway. Yes. No. No. Doesn't seem, there we go, okay. I'll get right in, be real close. Okay, um, this is a single page graphical uh, representation of the uh, defensible space and weed abatement process that we discussed at length uh, previously. Important, you know, this, this uh, is a consolidated document. Shout out to Corey for really taking the, the content from my presentation and, and massaging it into a single pager that can be used for uh, multiple discussions. Important there is there's a good list of the district resources to assist our residents in being compliant. You know, what, what are the tools that we can provide to help them out? Uh, it does give that timeline, which seems to be one of the main uh, points of education that we wanna get across. And then there's the additional information about uh, county weed abatement and how to make contacts with them. Um, so while this you know, has a lot of information and, and it can uh, serve people well, it's also a very good document to establish a conversation with. And as we were talking about, you know, these questions come up from people and they, they, they ask us these, and this is a good, good document to engage those, those people with that conversation. And so that, that's, the pretty much the end of the uh, uh, weed abatement fee space conversation, although it's going to continue for a long time. Um, but I think this is our tool. We we've done a fair amount of education. We have a good grasp of the programs, and we're ready to just meet the public and address their concerns. Thank you very much, and Any... thank you again, Corey, for constructing this page. It's awesome. Any comments? I have Jim. a comment or a question. <clears throat> I don't know which one it is really, maybe a combination of the two. First of all, I think this is a wonderful tool, but I'm, I'm still finding myself not being able to grasp what these steps are and how they relate to each other in a comprehensive fashion. For example, on this particular chart, there are two weed brush and rubbish declaration, hazard declaration. There's one on the right low hand, lower corner and there's one on the upper corner. Yes. Uh, the same exact wording. And I'm not sure how do these two relate to each other? That's number one question. Mm -hmm. um, and in, you know, and are they related? Are they not related? And the second question is the whole notion of um, the preseason we letter and then find and the self inspection packet. Are these, would these go to the same? same list or do they go to a subset of the same list or how do they actually this whole thing flows together i'm sorry it might be just like i'm really dense but i just don't seem to get it i apologize for that and if you could walk me through it or some fashion letting me know how that works i'll be happy sure fabulous uh, Thank you. May, I, may i take the moment to answer those questions okay Please. so that's exactly what this document does for us it, you know it really points out you can see graphically oh well, why are there those two so the commission you uh, vote twice a year with this list that's provided to declare that these properties are a hazard. And that allows county weed abatement 
to proceed with their uh, abatement process. It happens twice a year. Um, it happens once in November, and that's typically the list that's been gathered by the county. So all the properties within Los Altos Hills that have been reported to the county, uh, Mr. Kumar comes with those, or, uh, Mo comes with those that list. And the commission says, yes, these are a hazard and it, it grants him the authority to then go forward with abatement. The one that happens in May, that is the list that is pretty much generated by the fire district or the fire department. Uh, as County Fire goes out and does their inspections, they've come up with a list and they too say, here's a list of properties that need to be addressed. And so again, the commission says they are a hazard in our community. Uh, County Weed Abatement, please move forward. So that happens twice a year. Are these two lease lists somehow get consolidated into one or something? Yes, yes. That, that puts them onto County Weed Abatement's uh, abatement list. Okay. And, and that is, uh, it's available on their website. We can take a look at the those within the county, those within unincorporated county within our district, and those within Los Altos Hills, the town. So yes, it does compile into one list. Okay, wonderful, okay. thank you. I, and I then say the other portion was the, um, I'm sorry, the, the letters that go out. Right. Okay, so there's yes. two letters that go out. There's one letter that goes out in January, and that is to, that is from Santa Clara County Fire Department, Fire Prevention Division. And they send that to people that did not send in their self-inspection the previous year. And it's just a little bit of a rattle to say, hey, coming in February, you're going to see this packet. Okay. You, you didn't pay attention to it last year. We all know that and we're, we experience that fair amount in our, in our business, uh, getting people's attention to what we mail to them, it, it can be tough. So that is that list in January. It's those that didn't respond to the one from the previous year. Then in February, they send the, the mailer to those, uh, it goes to all residents, here's your packet for self-inspection. And they can fill it out and send it back. They can use the QR code, they can go to the website and they can fill it out. So those are the two mailings. What, so was it, that the question? Yeah, uh, okay. thank you. That's, that was very nice. The, the other question I have is that this self-inspection packet that gets sent out, does it get, get, does it get sent out to all residents or the residents on that list? No, the self-inspection packet goes to all residents in the town. Okay. Not everybody gets a physical visit by a fire engine. So everybody gets everyone that. gets a self-inspection. Okay, thank you. And. You know, it, it is in code, the, the defensible space and brush uh, clearing is, it's codified and so it's a, the homeowner's responsibility. So this is really kind of a, a, a beneficial tool of, hey, don't forget, you need to have 30 feet. You need to keep uh, branches away from your chimney by 10 feet. You need to clear out your gutters. You need to have your, uh, your uh, address in four inch minimum sized letters. So it's just helping them out with reminding them um, you know, drive on the right-hand side of the road, stop at all stop signs, that sort of thing. <laughs> Great. Yeah, uh, George. Sure, I've got, I've got a comment. And, and by the way, I like the, the process here. I like the drawing. Thanks for everybody for putting it together. In my professional life, I've been involved with a lot of process improvement and safety improvement processes. And so I think this is a good way to sort of codify it. And one thing I, I do like to see sometimes is something where it's fix the obvious at any time. It's kind of a, you know, you've got a process, but fix the obvious at any time. So last week, last month, I mentioned that there was a neighbor property that had never been abated ever and how annoying that was. And I walked out of that meeting. And so I sent a note, very simple note to sccweedabatement.org or something like that. And I sent a picture and all this, and I got an email right back saying, our contractor will take care of this. We'll make it a high priority. And I'm here to report that for the first time ever, that nearby property, the weeds are, are cut. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to get people in trouble. And I, I don't exactly know how this happened. But what I care about is the weeds were cut. And that's what happened. So, I'm, wow. uh, you know, that's, uh, we went outside the process, maybe. I don't know. But I, the result is kind of what mattered to me. Yeah. Wow. What a story. It's a, other comments, questions? Great. Any uh, public comment on this? Okay. We have public oh, comment yes. from Alan Epstein. Mm -hmm. 
Alan, you've got the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Besigi's questions, and I think the chart, which is very helpful, should be improved to incorporate the comments and explanations that were made. Um, missing from the chart is when the work is actually performed. And there was some questions raised at the last meeting about people being charged, um, but unclear if any work was actually being performed. And lastly, I'll say that um, I guess you have to be a commissioner to get response because I did exactly the same thing that Commissioner Tyson did with regards to a property and the property has not been abated and is still uh, there. Um, the people who worked on uh, Ravensbury Avenue to do the uh, evacuation planning uh, uh, cleanup work uh, drove right by that property and certainly could have seen um, all of the weeds that are still uh, on that property. Uh, Mr. Kumar said that the explanation was because the property is just vacant land but when I looked at the list that he prepared uh, for properties that are on the abatement list, there seems to be properties that uh, don't have addresses and um, look like they're vacant land as well. So I just would like to reiterate, there is a property right along Ravensbury that the district did a great job trying to make it um, less likely for there being a problem in evacuation. And one of the adjacent properties is uh, covered with weeds. So thanks so much. Great, thanks for the comments. And I certainly echo the fact that I think that, I think this is that this diagram is evolutionary. And as the questions come up, it, it just gets, it saves everyone time, the more stuff gets put in onto that. And this is the first cut at, which is great. So because in for all these years, you've never had a way to explain it at all. So thank you very much for all the effort that's gone into this, both of you actually. You're welcome. If I may have one thing, we have had uh, just this week again, um, uh, confusion about what an abated property looks like. And so uh, we received a comment from a citizen who were worried about this field, it's got a lot of grass on it. Uh, and even the photos that they sent illustrated that it had been dissed around the outside. Uh, so the properties on Ravensbury, I was just there last week, they are they're cleared on the edges um, and they, they meet the requirement. Yes, it's, there's a large field of grass, but it is uh, abated to the standard. And um, we, we live in a republic, write to your congressman if you want to change the rules. But, uh, Excellent. That's, uh, Appreciate the comment. That's very illuminating. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just really quick to add on to Ryan. I drove by the property that I had gotten the, the picture sent and it came through Firewise. So, you know, it's someone feeling empowered. But it, it was, like Ryan said, to the ordinance expectation. It may not be to the residential expectation. You do not have to have a completely mowed field to be to the ordinance expectation. So there is a, an educational piece in there. Um, is the grass a fire ha hazard? Yes, grass can burn, but it's not required to be removed. It, that's an option to the resident. So, I see. Great. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next here, we're moving on to... President Spring, oh. I'm going to let you use your discretion. Um, the same public member has their hand raised again. I don't know if we're. I think we're going to move on at this moment. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, we're moving on to. Let's see. Where am I? I've lost my 12D. I think this is. Is that correct? 12C. Uh, 12C. Too many 12s. Uh, this will be the uh, integrated hazardous fuel reduction field operations. Um, also by the same person, I think. There we go. Thank you again, commissioners. Um, my presentation on 12C will talk about the Morrow Ravensbury project. Uh, then we'll let's review our IHFR quarter one and two project summaries. Uh, then we will talk about the defensible space brush chipping and debris removal, the summary for quarter one and two, and then what it looks like this month. Since our last meeting, uh, specifically on Mora uh, Ravensbury, we were able to uh, secure the rest of our permits. Um, we've met a number of milestones there, as you can see there. Each, now, each uh, project has a unique kind of learning opportunity and flavor. The Mora Ravensbury Avenue is a, a lot of residential area, and we had the greatest amount of residential interaction on this project. 
Um, from that, I think we're going to we're, we're going to evaluate and try some new outreach methods before we start a program or a project. Um, some really good feedback from folks. Um, so all the all the the milestones there you can see were selected and we move forward with the project. Can I see the next slide. All right. We moved forward with the project and it's now done. We started uh, last Wednesday and completed it by Friday. Uh, Huertas has been known to be, you know, they're very rapid. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the time there, we, we, we really put a push on the last Friday. Um, so you'll note that, uh, you'll see that the, the, uh, the volume is up, but it doesn't always tie to the weight. And we discovered, or Huertas knew this, but I, I learned this, um, trees are denser than brush. And so when we were taking out uh, you know, larger vegetation, it weighed more, but we still had a, a fair amount of, of uh, volume as well as weight. We covered uh, the three and 8.18. Um, <laughs> in a residential area, you have less volunteer uh, kind of growth. It's more, you know, planted and such. And so there really was less, less depth of treatment on these. Um, the biggest thing was granting access to the roadway. There was a fair amount of intrusion to the roadway. And if I tried to illustrate that with the pictures that we were able to capture. If you look at the top picture, that, uh, that semi truck is having to stay in their lane because of our lane closure and they are running into that brush. Uh, then in the clearing, that's actually on Mora, Here's a cement truck that's going up to a construction project and they're driving past our, our work vehicles, but we've cleared the space there and they're able to get through. And then at the very bottom in the middle, you see that other semi coming down Ravensbury and it's very obvious you know, where we've done our clearing and how that vehicle can pass. Now, yes, the vehicle in that case, you know, he's taking a little bit of the center of the lane because it's easier that way, but and fire engines can do that. But in the event of a significant fire, no, there's gonna be people coming down out of that hill and they need to be able to traverse that road going towards the fire, staying in their lane. And that's why it's so imperative that we, we, we push that vegetation back and reclaim the roadway. Um, this was a uh, definitely a, a, a concierge kind of uh, service on this one. Uh, the very last illustration there, um, we need to do a little extra cleanup for this, this woman. And so all hands on deck, we finished it up, cleaned it up to her, to her liking. And now at 92 years old, she's gonna haul the gravel from her truck up her driveway, up her steep driveway in a wheelbarrow and fill that in. Oh, so, very pleased with that. Okay, let's move on then to uh, our quarter one and quarter two HIZ, or I'm sorry, uh, IHFR projects. This is a recap of what we accomplished uh, earlier this year. We're two thirds of the way through the year. We've completed three projects. We're on, on task to complete our fourth, possibly even five this year. Uh, the two significant ones you recall the burn preserve with our herbivore grazing and then the page mill uh, evacuation route maintenance that we reviewed last uh, most recently. All right, let's take a look at uh, defensible space brush chipping and debris removal. So this is a very uh, busy spreadsheet. However, what this represents, you know, th those were the projects that the district did. Brush chipping is the, the projects that our residents have done to remove fuel from our, our, our district. And we support their areas with this, with this program. Um, Take a focus on the percentage change. So I, I presented to you two columns, the 2023 and then the 2022 side by side. I've highlighted the highlights or even the, the most, uh, the, the orange ones are the, the expense ones. But you can see that we've grown our customer base by almost 14%. Uh, the volume has increased by 276%. The volume per person or per household has gone up 200 and 12%, um, the cost per unit, you know, this is Costco economics. Uh, you buy more, you get it for less. So the, the <laughs> price the price per unit has gone down by 61%. Um, 
our operating costs have increased by 44%, but that's, that's ex quite acceptable if you look at the rest. If this was a business, uh, I'd be pretty pleased if I could grow my market share by 14%, uh, have each customer use my service over 200% more often, and then the, my price per widget is down by 60%. So this, this program goes is operating phenomenally. I hope it continues. Um, you know, we, we've even recognized that uh, some of our assumptions for bidding and things may be even out of date. We're, we're telling our bidders, well, we probably have about 30 yards per person. And then, you know, we're, we're consistently closer to more like 100. So we're going to have to, uh, we'll, we'll work with that on that. So where are we going? Let's see the next one. Actually, can I, can I interrupt on this last Please. slide? Just because I have a question. We'll go back. Yeah. Um, to what do you attribute the, the huge increase per person? Is it they've dis is it that this year there was just so much more growth, or that they've are they using the program more since it's because it's more available more than just semi annually, or what? What do you think is the biggest driver to such growth? Yeah. Um, looking at our surveys, um, the a number of new, over 10% on our surveys say they've used the service for the first time, which is consistent mm -hmm. with, with what we see here in growth. So they've, and their survey markings say, I heard about it from a neighbor. So I think the word of mouth is getting out there. And so more people are using it. Now, as for the volume, we certainly saw the spike with our, our trees down and things like that. Um, I spoke to a gentleman today who said he's still hauling trees off his property. So it could still be residual, um, but maybe they just are finding it, hey, this, this works. Right. Um, and he, he did comment that his arborist, you, you know, the, the, arbor, the, the margin for the arborist is in the work. That's where they make their profit. Hauling is, an, is a, it's a wash. It's usually pretty much, you know, they, they only mark it up a little bit. So if they can avoid that completely, they can be off working on somebody else's property with higher margin. So I think that's being taken advantage of. Not, you know, that was just this one comment from this one person. I can't prove it across the board, but I think that's why uh, was a reason in this particular one, he's using it more because uh, it's a great service and his arborist is like, thank you, you know, I'll save yeah. money. Yes. <laughs> I can just give you some quick feedback from the residents that I've had in the Firewise meetings. They really like the um, the on-call uh, type. You know, the twice a year is great for planning, but like they don't have to think about when am I going to do my work. I'm just going to do my work, and that shipping's available. They really like that. And then I have um, neighbors that once they understand that it is available, they've gone around to their neighbors with the piles that are just sitting there that have been unattended, said, hey, all you have to do is pull it to the side, sign up right here with our trifold brochure that has a nice QR code. And so that's another component that I know they've been doing because they feel educated and empowered now mm -hmm. to do that. So that's me. Okay. Great, great numbers. I'm just, I'm just intrigued by it. Thanks so much. I'd also like to um, thank Captain Cronin for his professionalism and not telling you all that he caught me in my pajamas <laughs> watching him chip up my brush pile one morning. Oh. <laughs> he didn't include a photo of that. Yeah, very exciting. All right. So let's take a look at this month. Um, so this slide was generated last week. So that number on the bottom is now up to 120. So the graph on the right should be all the way up to that 120 line. Um, so the trend, it, it continues. Uh, resident participation is high, uh, positive experience, uh, a lot of outreach. Uh, it seems to be growing the customer base. I still, I'm suspicious that the volume might be seasonal. Um, proof will be in the pudding, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. All in all, it's uh, a, amazing program and it's running really well. Mm -hmm. End of report. Great. Thank you. Well, I guess we've had any other, other comments beyond what we've just done. I think we had a good discussion. Thank you so much. Any public comment on that? Seeing none, hearing none. Great. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. We will move on now to, that puts us on 12D. Do I have this one right? Uh, this will be, uh, uh, Oh, actually, you're still up there. Reports on future evacuation programs. Uh, this will be. 
the, oh, right, this is, uh, here we go. Ah, Programs Planning Grants Manager Woods providing this report. Thank you. Do we have some slides? Oh, by the way, just let you know, I'm colorblind, so sometimes when things are highlighted, oh. I can't see the text, and so oh, I'm trying to see uh, which, which, which person. Well, while we're waiting for the slides, I know, like I know. To, <laughs> it's too late, it's wrong. I'd like to congratulate all of you, the planning, the approval, and everything, because clearly the brush chipping program is working. The, one of the main goals was to provide that heavy lift. You do the work, we'll help you with the contractors, we'll figure out how to move it for you, and the synergy is fantastic. It's working great. Okay, um, this speaks to our regionalism. These are two of the um, groups that I've worked with and things I've worked on, you know, that extend beyond the district. The first one is the countywide multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. This um, is similar to the CWPP, but it's not just for wildfire. So some of you may be familiar with a HMP. It's, it's much broader and we don't have a direct annex in the HMP as the fire district, but a lot of our projects and items are covered by the town's annex. So I worked with the town to make sure that our projects and programs are included in the Los Altos Hill, the town of Los Altos Hills um, annex. And then we also made sure that anything that isn't that's in our unincorporated, I worked with the county and their planning staff to make sure that the umbrella was created to include anything that we would do in the unincorporated act that isn't listed in the town annex. So the handshake between those two covers all of our activities. And the reason that this is important is because you can't qualify for grants and FEMA support and those types of things if you're not, if you don't have a approved, FEMA approved HMP in process. So at the county level, We've heard, we've, they've, um, we've shared with you the postings that they did for reviewing the county HMP, or the, the town had its HMP public comment period. Now the county's taking the, those and putting together for their public comment period. And then they're also going to run the um, FEMA approval and the Cal OES approval simultaneously. The reason this becomes very important to us at the local level is our HMP in this county expired in December last December. And we all know we've got our FEMA grant pending for I-280. If the awards come up before the HMP is approved, they will not make an offer to us. And the county also has a sub-application in there for Highway 35, and the town has a sub-application in there. So we're all really motivated to get our HMP back in place again. So this is the important update, and we're close. We're, we're in the home stretch, so. So it's complicated, there's lots of layers. I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions on this before we move to the next one. Any questions? Nope, thank you. Woohoo, run. <laughs> next slide. Okay, you've heard about the projects that we have um, just completed, and this is the next one in the pipeline. And Harmon is going to run this one for us. So we took him out and gave a field tour of our next upcoming projects. And this slide is an enhanced slide that you saw from last uh, month to show you what the connectivity is and why these are important and how they're starting to connect together. So we, they're in blue, we've connected to Ravensbury Mora that Ryan just told us about. Um, the connectivity to the community strategic fuel break is on the lower portion in green. Midpin continues to work on that one. And um, we just made a visit to Hidden Villa on Friday and they're excited to re-engage. They have new leadership over there that I've finally been able to connect with. So we'll be looking more at that one. And then we have, the upcoming one in the upper right in red, or the whole upper part of the map, which we hope to put on the ground October 23rd, and that connects to Ravensbury Moor, and now we'll get you out of the mid-pin land, up the road, and if you can't get onto the freeway, we'll get you under the freeway and move you towards Foothill or the next freeway entrance. 
Um, and then of course, there's our long-term planning in orange, which connects us to the I-280 fuel break. So, any questions on this one? Jim. Mm -hmm. I, I have a comment. I, I think this is a wonderful map. Thank I you. think it's finally more or less connects everything together. You know, the second the role of the secondary, you know, the role, role of the primary. So my question here is, if we get into a situation where the uh, state and FEMA are not forthcoming with the, with the funds for the I-280, and I-280 seems to me like, regardless of what you do with the secondary, it still is massively important in the middle of this whole, this whole uh, map. So is there any uh, thoughts about wanting to maybe do a, something less than complete perfection on I-280, but get all the kind of low hanging fruit so that we have a decent, uh, meat corridor that's been reasonably hardened as opposed to completely perfect that we, we would get so and based on our own money as opposed to waiting sure twofold um answer there we're connecting all these routes that we saw on there to what would be our i-280 project so that's our preparation so that when we're you know what whatever the commission decides based on when the grant comes in or doesn't come in um, and the current scope for I-280 that's been submitted in the grant application is built into four phases. Now we can't pull those phases apart without compromising our grant application. So as soon as we get the word, it will be up to you and what your will is to go forward. And we can do it in a phased approach at that point. Meanwhile, while we're waiting, we're in this strange limbo of waiting for it. We're connecting everything to the edges of what I-280 will be ready to put on the ground. So, okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Let's continue. Next slide, Corey. We'll take public comments on all the things when you're done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another regional planning effort, the CWPP. You've heard about this on a monthly basis. Um, the final draft is ready on August 30th, as we've um, heard comments earlier. And it's true, the, the draft is not up on the Fire Safe Council website. They took it down after the public comment period and gave it back to their um, environmental consulting firm to implement all the public comments and add it to it. So that's what this presentation is. It's that final draft. Um, we're working on getting, you know, a print a copy in advance, but it'll be back up again by the 30th. Um, and again, reminder, the annexes are not in the, the August 30th. Annexes belong to all the annex holders. So those updates have to be done by each of the 18 annex holders. Some I've gotten word just this week, this past week that about half of those are updated. So people are taking it seriously and they're moving along. So that part's excellent. Um, the project tracker is up on the county website or the Fire Safe Council website. The project tracker is what everyone will be able to input their projects. So you've heard me talk about connectivity before and regionalism and that those things are so important to us because wildfire doesn't stop at any line. <laughs> so the project tracker is countywide and could even reach further eventually so that we can hear from everybody that's doing this. Fire Safe Council, Saratoga, Monte Serino, Midpin, our neighbors, our projects will be able to be added to this story map because the more connectivity you do in evacuation routes and fuel breaks, the more effective it is. So super excited to add the project tracker. That's brand new for our county. Um, and then it'll go to the Board of Supervisors to be accepted. And on our side, on the right-hand side of the slide is our Annex 4 updates. We do have draft one in-house with the staff. Um, Paige and I have been spending quite a bit of time going through that. And we've just moved it to General Manager Logan uh, yesterday today so that we can start to look at that we've we're, we're putting together our um, project maintenance or project matrix excuse me so it's coming we'll have and then the next steps on that are to, to submit it the draft for you to look at and to set up a public outreach and comment period and then we'll get it over to countywide or over to fire safe council to be added to the countywide um, document but again the annexes don't go to the Board of Supervisors, so we don't have a hard stop 
by August 30th the way that they do to move it along. So. Great. Any questions, comments? Nope. Any public comments on any of this item? Seeing none. Great. Thank you so much. We will move on to item 13, personnel. Um, I'm going to say General Manager Logan is going to present item 13 for us. Uh, yes, thank you, President Spreen. The first personnel item recommended for approval is item 13A, is the proposed First Amendment to the Project Specialist Employment Agreement for Corey Beebe, which is included in the agenda packet. Government Code Section 54953C3 requires the Commission to orally report a summary of the proposed compensation before taking final action to adopt that compensation here by approving the First Amendment to the Employment Agreement. The proposed First Amendment extends the term of the at-will part-time temporary employment agreement to February 29th, 2024, revises the work hours to 30 hours per month, and adjusts the total not to exceed compensation to $12,600 with no additional changes to compensation or benefits. I recommend approval of the First Amendment to the employment agreement for Corey Beebe. Thank you. Thank you, General Manager. Are there any clarifying questions from the Commission? Not seeing any. I would now entertain a motion. Will the Commissioner making and then seconding the motion? Please Basigi state your moves. name. I'm sorry. Jim oh, Basigi moves. makes the motion. Thanks and seconds. Thanks and seconds. Uh, items open. Any discussion from the Commission? No need for that. Any public comment on this item? Seeing none, uh, we will take a roll call. President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Thank you very much. Item, and we'll move on to item 13B. General Manager Logan? Uh, yes, thank you, President Spreen. The second personnel item recommendation for approval is item 13B. Is, is the proposed First Amendment to the Technical Analyst Project Manager Employment Agreement with Ryan Cronin. Government Code Section 54953C3 requires the Commission to orally report a summary of the proposed compensation before taking final action to adopt that compensation, here by approving the First Amendment to the Employment Agreement. The proposed compensation is described in the proposed First Amendment to the Technical Analyst Project Manager Employment Agreement included in the materials for this agenda item. The proposed First Amendment to the at-will part-time employment agreement includes an effective compensation start date of September 1st, 2023, and includes the following compensation, wages and adjust total compensation to $83,050 oh, eight, $83 per hour, $83 dollars and 50 cents per hour. Base compensation shall not exceed $88,176,000 on an annual basis without written approval of the general manager and notification to the president of the board of commissioners. Two, all other compensation and health benefits remain the same. Three, oh, I'm sorry, let me restate that. Number two, all other compensation and benefit terms remain the same. Three, the proposed employment agreement does not provide vacation, holiday, pay, medical benefits, or retirement benefits. I recommend approval of the First Amendment to the employment agreement for Ryan Cronin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any clarifying questions from the commission? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion, probably from this side, just to keep things balanced. I move to approve. Thank uh, you. Sherlock moves to approve. McDonald seconds. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, any public comments? Seeing none, let's move to a roll call. President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Besigi? Enthusiastic, yes. Oh, great. <laughs> Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Okay. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Great, thank you so much. We will now on to item 14, which is uh, IT finance and district clerk reports. 14A is a report on the website updates and improvements from General Annis Analyst Georgie, if you would present this. Thank you, President Spreen. Good evening, Commission, staff, and public. On behalf of the communications team, I'm pleased to provide you with an update on the improvements that have been applied to the district website. Next slide. 
We're excited to share these updates with the public. And if you visited the site between August 2nd and today, you may have already observed some differences. I'll highlight these changes in the following slides and then we'll briefly provide a live demo at the end. Next, please. So as stated in the memorandum report in the July commission meeting, staff have made interim site connect corrections and modifications intended to help the overall user experience. Our vendor took initial steps to optimize the site's search engine functionality and the communications team reorganized the global navigation and submenus, bringing key information up a layer or two so fewer clicks are required to reach it. Also of note, the order of content above the fold on the homepage, that is what you can see without scrolling when you first load our website, was optimized to make information related to current events and projects more visible. Next slide, please. So as a courtesy to users, we've updated the thin red banner that sits at the top of each page just to indicate that the site's been refreshed and that links to a blog that provides a really brief overview. Next slide. And so here's a screenshot of our blog. The announcement briefly highlights the improvements that have been made and I'll explain a little more. Next slide. So one of the big improvements that we've made is adding meetings to the global navigation bar. Analytics for the website have indicated that the commission meetings page is the second most popular page on the site, second only to the home page. Um, so that is what informed this decision. And now meetings can be accessed in three different places. So we hope that it makes it very easy and convenient for the public to get information. Next slide. We believe that popular pages will be easier to find thanks to our new navigation structure. And in particular, if you look at the, uh, the red bar, which shows the new navigation, programs and projects have been separated into different categories, which make it easier to distinguish between programs residents can participate in versus district managed projects, such as evacuation route hardening. Also, please note that emergency preparedness has been renamed community outreach here, and that aligns with our chart of services as outlined in the strategic plan. Next slide. Uh, so this breaks out some of the new areas on the homepage. We've created a tile in the lower left corner for our video gallery and added feature boxes in the right column that have popular links and upcoming events. These links were formerly nested in drop-down menus and users would have to search for them, but now they are visible and accessible from the homepage. Next slide. Generally speaking, there were no major rewrites of content. Rather, we made small surgical optimizations to improve areas of potential confusion. For example, information about staffing station eight has been corrected to live under the other district services section instead of within projects. And site visitors looking for information about CERT can learn about the program in fewer clicks as all of it has been folded into the page. And the final slide. So there is more to come. Search optimization and content revitalization will be ongoing and we plan to conduct a comprehensive evaluation of the site that can inform the redesign plan for fiscal year 23-24. Next slide. So that concludes the presentation. We wanted to give a special acknowledgement to our vendor and the communications team and everyone who's worked on this. Um, and then now we can walk you through the site really briefly, just because it's a little more interesting than screenshots. Mm -hmm. All right, so when you first land on the homepage, one of the first things you'll notice is we've refreshed the banner with a new aerial image of the Los Altos Hills. And then in the main column, their area formerly occupied by the newsletter signup box is now dynamic. This will feature projects and events and other relevant information for the community. In the event of an emergency, critical emergency info will be posted here per usual. Uh, the right column features uh, the fire services pages that were formerly nested under the about section. And if you can scroll down a little bit, there's also an area that will feature current events. So people don't have to go and search the calendar to find them. Um, and then if we could go back up to the global navigation and hover over about. And so here we simplified this area. This had a bunch of other links which are now in the right column. If you hover over programs, 
we cleaned up the program's menu and eliminated an unnecessary intermediate landing page that was adding more clicks for users to find program info now that they're more readily available and especially under the risk reduction section. Those are the ones that residents are looking for the most, especially per analytics. Um, the projects page makes it easier to find information about district projects and plans such as evacuation route projects. This information was previously mixed in with program info and so now it has its own area. And then under community outreach, uh, this menu houses our emergency preparedness resources. And there haven't been any changes made to governance. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, meetings has been added as a tab. And uh, that concludes my report. We're really pleased to roll out the changes and happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, great. I just want to say I'm, I'm so happy to see this much focus put on this kind of thing because I know where the old navigation things came from and not only incremental thought had been given to it. And I know how much effort it is to really look at all the routes through the site and really to be overlaying people's real usage of the site at the same time. So I really appreciate this kind of focus being given to it. Any other comments? Yes, please. Yeah, great job at simplifying um, a, a tough website to navigate. I mean, it's been a lot of information. I know it was hard to balance. How do you keep the info and still make it meaningful and pay attention to where people are going and make those easier to get to, et cetera. So I really appreciate the time put in there. And I think that there is a longer term plan that we'd all love to hear about for when you do a real redesign because you've done all the pre-work to really simplify making that next step. So thank you. It's terrific. Nice. Any public comments on this? Seeing none. We will, thank you so much. We'll move on to item 14B, which is reporting on the annual finance audit. This will be finance manager Moriale. Hello, uh, can I, can you hear me? Is my audio active? Mm -hmm. Yes, hi, President, President Spring and Vice President Sherlock, members of the commission, good evening. Uh, this report follows up on the last meeting when staff announced the plans for the fiscal year 22-23 audit. Since that last report, uh, the audit process has start, started in earnest. Uh, we had startup meetings taking place last week, in the last weeks of July, and the audit process actually began and kicked off on August 1st. Uh, we are pleased to report that Fector & Company has again assigned Mr. Scott German as the auditor in charge. And you may recall his name. He was the person that was in charge of the audit last year and conducted conducted our field work, so this adds a consistency to the process. Corey and I have been busy the past, past two weeks providing a myriad of schedules, ledgers, and reconciliations to allow testing to begin, uh, numbers to accumulate, and financial report preparation to begin. All is on schedule as we plan for a draft to be provided to this commission at the next meeting and a final in October. That's our tentative plan uh, at the moment. Uh, staff is still assessing the expansion of the format for a national and state award application status. Um, at the most, we will present the district's first version of such a product, and at the least, we'll at least start to introduce some elements of that reporting with a plan to round it out in the following year. Producing such a report requires a compilation of several years of historical data and comparisons, so we'll give it our best effort this year, but at the very least, try to supplement the financial report with some of those metrics and historical reports. I wanted to also indicate that as the numbers evolve, evolve and Corey and I are looking at the 22-23 numbers, uh, we do anticipate a, a healthy financial uh, year, um, even above the levels forecasted in the budget season. Revenues, again, are, have shown a uh, strong gain and expenses remained under budget. Uh, unassigned fund balances are expected to increase and fund commitments will remain the same uh, at the prior year levels. We did see this year um, the purchases of equipment specifically in the area of technology and there were no additional FTEs in the fiscal year 22-23 year, although as we know in the budget process for 23-24, um, those resource, resources will be expanded. And with that, that uh, completes my update for the audit for 22-23. Excellent, thank you. Any questions or clarifying comments from commissioners? Seeing none, any public comments? Seeing none, great, thank you so much. Let's see, we will now move on to item 15, uh, commission member reports. 
15A, uh, this is an opportunity for commissioners to provide reports on any future agenda topics. Are there any comments from the commission on future agenda topics? Any public comments on future agenda topics? One day we'll get one of these. Okay, uh, 15B, the next regular commission meeting is scheduled for September 19th, 2023, in person and hybrid to be held at the same location, 26379 Fremont Road, Los Altos Hills, in this town hall council chambers. Let's see, uh, any additional comments from the commission on that? Is there any issue here? I assume we should have everyone plans to be here. It sounds good. In that case, uh, we will, unless there are any final comments from staff, we will move on to item 16, adjournment. This concludes the August 15th, 2023 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The meeting is adjourned at 9.20 p.m. Uh, Emergency Services Manager Beebe, please stop the recording.